Welcome to the neighborhood of Harlem, one of Manhattan's most iconic districts that revolutionized so many areas of art. Whether music, poetry, visual art, or literature, Harlem reshaped the culture of New York City and influenced the rest of the world. I'm Jose, and I invite you to the streets of Harlem to take a tour of the history of one of Manhattan's most iconic neighborhoods. On this tour, we'll explore the remains of the Harlem Renaissance, the movement that developed the New York neighborhood into the mecca of African-American culture. We'll walk the parklands of Harlem and discover the history before the Renaissance, which still contains the home to a famed founding father who graces the $10 bill. So let's go on tour to the Manhattan neighborhood of Harlem. This is the one train. It's heading to the greater area of Harlem, a neighborhood in Upper Manhattan that became a pioneer in American history. And we exit at one of the few above ground stations on the island, which leads to some of the most important parts of Harlem. New York's metro system is a web that takes us across the five boroughs and is the best form of transportation around this busy city. And from the street level, we see the fascinating engineering that brought to life the connection to Uptown. Harlem, New York. It almost has its own identity because of the massive impact the area has had on the history of the city. Harlem was settled by the Dutch in the 1600s and named after the city of Harlem in Holland. But it wasn't until the iconic Harlem Renaissance movement that the neighborhood really engineered the image of Harlem. The neighborhood brought in a new wave of creative talent from all over the world in what historians call the Great Migration, making music genres like jazz explode into mainstream America ushering in a new legacy of contributions by African Americans to the great American narrative. At the edges of Harlem is the home of a founding father. Located in Hamilton Heights, it becomes part of the larger St. Nicholas Park, and visitors can tour the estate of this fascinating leader while exploring one of the hilliest parks in the area. A 23-acre park that spans from 128th Street to 141st Street. It was originally farmland from the Dutch settlers, a distant memory before New York grew to the largest city in America. This was the Grange of the famed Alexander Hamilton, the infamous founding father from the popular play of the same name. Alexander Hamilton was a visionary who kickstarted the American Industrial Revolution when he stumbled upon the Great Falls of the Passaic in Patterson, New Jersey. The Grange was built on this estate, which Hamilton owned 32 acres of land. It was completed in 1802, two years prior to Hamilton's death after the duel against Aaron Burr. Inside the Grange, we get a closer look at the life of Alexander Hamilton, a leader who made his mark in the streets of New York and became a close ally of George Washington. This small museum contains curious visitors, myself included, as the interest in Hamilton has grown over the years. But who was this controversial figure as we read so many stories throughout these exhibits? Hamilton was a key author in crafting the Constitution and composing Washington's most important documents during the American Revolution. A statesman who also had a fair share of tragedy, like the death of his son in a similar manner to his own fate. On this stamp, I leave my mark as a tourist to the national site.
Oh wow. From here we we'll be able to see the top of all the buildings. During the American Revolution, George Washington fortified the area of Harlem to block the British from leading to the farmlands of northern Manhattan. St. Nicholas Park was built on a rugged mass of rock, and the upper terrace contains City College, which overlooks the buildings of Harlem. City College was founded in 1847 as the first free public institution of higher education in America. And from the terrace, we can see the whole neighborhood. City College was founded by a wealthy businessman named Townsend Harris with the goal of providing education for the poor and children of immigrants. In doing so, it started a new house of public education, followed by Boston, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. City College was designed by George Post, an architect whose work includes the New York Stock Exchange and the Liberal Arts Building of the Chicago World Fair. We see students walking around the campus of this uniquely designed school, which is a top performer in the World Report of Best Colleges, and it's seen 10 alumni go on to win Nobel Peace Prizes. From City College, we take a last walk in the neighborhood of Hamilton Heights, a neighborhood of traditional brownstones and row houses found all over New York City. One of the most impactful forms of African-American art that grew from the Harlem Renaissance was jazz. It didn't begin in Harlem, but this is a place where it developed into the mainstream toward the force that it is today. The Renaissance birthed legendary figures like Billie Holiday, Duke Ellington, and Fats Waller, whose sound echoes through these streets and would be played night after night as we grew into mainstream America. My favorite genre of music and one that changed the musical world way beyond the borders of Manhattan. Let's talk about the birth of style and the trendsetter that is Harlem, New York City. When we walk these streets, the murals write the stories of Harlem's colorful history. Dizzy was a major figure in the birth of bebop and modern jazz, influencing legends like Miles Davis. Dizzy was also a pioneer of the Afro-Cuban jazz sounds. This is a perfect reminder of the great jazz history that roamed the streets of Harlem. But he's only one of the many greats that have passed through the streets of Harlem. In these classic films, we go back to the Renaissance, where Harlem birthed icon after icon like poet Langston Hughes, who pioneered jazz poetry, or sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois, the first African-American to earn a PhD from Harvard, and Marcus Garvey, founder of the Universal Negroes Improvement Association. Ed Sullivan was a late show host who influenced generations. Ben Hogan, Roberta Peters, Kisari Siepi, and other Met stars salute our fifth year with our sponsors. So don't you forget our star-studded show Sunday night, April 4th. From all the great history contained in the streets of Harlem comes the weight of a troubled past. As I make my way back to 125th Street, I see the sadness of the buildings. And the murals continue to write the story of what's happening in these streets. Activists like Malcolm X and Yuri Kochiyama make up the voice of this mural. Harlem has experienced two major riots dating back to 1943 and 1964, where the country 
was at a turning point. An off-duty police officer murdered an African-American teenager, which erupted into six nights of rioting across New York City, moments that continue to plague American history and are the pictures painted by Malcolm so many decades ago. In these historic streets, we've heard the whispers of Harlem's change and leaders that fought for inclusion. Like this statue of Adam Clayton Powell, the first African-American elected to Congress. As a lone voice, Powell became the symbol for a nation, challenging laws that segregated African-Americans, later becoming Title IV of the Civil Rights Act. The Harlem Renaissance was an awakening for African-Americans across the country, and it filled them with pride and empowerment after centuries of being suppressed. It was an early ignition that sparked the Civil Rights Movement. Let's step into modern Harlem and one of its most symbolic streets, 125th Street, the de facto main street of the neighborhood. It contains the historic Apollo Theater, which launched the careers of so many African-American icons. The Apollo Theater opened in 1913, becoming a prominent venue for African-American performers. It's a historic landmark in New York City. This street is one of the original planned streets that make up the Manhattan grid, where it runs from east to west, from Fifth Avenue to the Henry Hudson Parkway. And the frantic movement of New York residents remind us that we're still in the busiest city in America. And Harlem is in its own bubble where major businesses wrap around buildings and you can find soul food that's only unique to the area, a neighborhood where you don't have to go far to find everything you need. Absolutely, thank you. Jose on tour. Jose on tour, it's an easy one. Thanks for coming up here. Absolutely, thank you. This is Strivers Row, considered some of the greatest architectural stylings of New York City from the 19th century. Strivers Row was built for the wealthier residents of Harlem. David King Jr., who also developed the base of the Statue of Liberty, wanted to create an upper middle class neighborhood independent of outside influences. Some of the issues David faced came in the form of empty homes. The nation experienced an economic depression in the late 1800s leading to the houses being foreclosed by some of the bank lenders who helped develop this community. By that time, many white residents were moving away from Harlem, opening up the homes to middle-class African-Americans. And the fire truck pulled up right beside me. That's why I love New York City. Jazz wasn't the only music that was synonymous with Harlem. In the 1960s, a new renaissance took place with a group of new Harlem residents. Salsa music emerged from its humble roots in Cuba and Puerto Rico to dominate the mainstream charts as one of the musical pillars of the Latin world. Dominican-born Johnny Pacheco was a musician and producer trained in the Juilliard School of Arts. Pacheco was one of the pioneers of salsa for the streets of East Harlem, or better known as Spanish Harlem. The area saw an influx of Puerto Rican residents, giving Johnny Pacheco inspiration to make this new salsa sound become a global sensation. 
With the humble beginnings of his label, Fania Records, Pacheco recruited a lot of the local talent from East Harlem and the Bronx, who went on to become legendary musicians, like that of Hector Laveau, Celia Cruz, and Willie Colon. East Harlem was once home to many of New York's Italian residents and was the original home of Little Italy. But after the First World War, East Harlem had a big rise with Latin residents, specifically from the Caribbean nations of Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and Cuba. With the big migration came the construction of Latin-owned businesses like bodegas, botanicas, and restaurants. It's home to one of the largest Latin American enclaves in the country. And the murals painted on the buildings depict the everyday life of Puerto Rican residents. Puerto Ricans are the majority in this part of the neighborhood, containing one of the highest concentrations in all of New York City. On this ride, we go back underground, as the train takes us to our next destination. And the train cars slide into the tunnels of the subway, taking us to the border of the Greater Harlem area in the neighborhood of Morningside Heights. This is Riverside Drive, one of the longest connecting trails in Manhattan. At this edge, we come across the tomb of an American president, a giant mausoleum for a man who battled on the side of Lincoln during the Civil War. And I take a slow walk through the entry path, stunned by this hidden landmark in the edges of Harlem. The mausoleum is visible from the Harlem River as one of the few landmarks not obstructed by the towering skyscrapers of the city. This happens to be the largest mausoleum in all of North America, the final resting place of President Ulysses S. Grant and his wife, Julia. Grant was the 18th president of America and also a commanding general of the Union during the Civil War. Upon Grant's death, he wished to be buried in New York, creating slight setbacks as most American leaders were being moved to Washington, D.C. But the family pushed back to honor the president's wishes, and in respect to the family, the mausoleum was completed in 1897. Visitors at this beautiful structure are amazed by the architecture of the mausoleum, with columns that mirror those of the Lincoln Memorial. It's a structure pulled out of the pages of the National Mall, and the casket of the president is monumental. In our final path, we look out into the Hudson and see the recurring bridge that's become synonymous with Upper Manhattan the George Washington. Back in the neighborhood, the evening stars light up the city. So if you're new to my channel, just know that pizza is my favorite food. I try to pick some up with every tour, and I couldn't go to Manhattan and not pick up some delicious Neapolitan. It's time to eat. my Harlem tour. Look at where I'm at. I knew Manhattan was hilly, but not to this extent. And this is a scenario for most of northern Manhattan once you get past Central Park. Morningside Park is the epitome of Upper Manhattan. With a remarkable terrain, it spans 30 acres. The top of Morningside Park 
is a 100-foot cliff that overlooks Harlem. From this view, you can see everything happening in the neighborhood, from the busy traffic to the upper subway and New Yorkers engaged in daily routines. This is the pinnacle of the Uptown story. The greater Harlem area is without a doubt one of the most important neighborhoods in New York City. Harlem is an instrumental root of African-American history to the flourishing story of America. And Harlem adds vibrancy and colors to diversify the American biography with a movement that changed the world, further cementing New York City as the land of endless possibilities. I'm Jose, and if you've enjoyed what you've seen today, please subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and share. If you want to see more adventures in the great neighborhoods of Manhattan, please stay tuned for the following video. Until next time.